it is a tried and true tradition for a minister to open a sermon with a bit of humor. I know a guy who does this at funerals, and I, just, I think it's tacky as all hell. His jokes are funny, but I just think it's just tacky to decide for a room full of people they're going to laugh <clears throat> when they're there to mourn. But he does it because he's nervous, and he has to give a, a sermon at a funeral. I say, just give your sermon and go home, but... <clears throat> A woman brings her duck to the vet. The vet comes into the room and the woman says, there's something wrong with my duck. And the vet says, the duck is dead. And the woman says, you didn't even examine, you didn't run any tests, you didn't do anything. And you just tell me the duck's dead. The vet goes, fine. He brings in a black Labrador retriever, and the Labrador sniffs the duck, shakes his head, leaves the room. That brings in a cat. The cat sniffs the duck, shakes his head, leaves the room. The vet said, like I said, the duck is dead. And the woman goes, okay. So when she gets her bill, it's $820. She's like, what? You charged me $820 to tell me my duck is dead? And the vet said, well, had you just taken my word for it, it would have only been 20 But lab reports and CAT scans are very expensive. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Lab reports and cat skin. All right. That's, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I knew it was good. <laughs> I just, I just derailed my own, my own sermon. <laughs> All right. It's okay. I really don't have much to say. <laughs> I've been practicing it all day. <laughs> all right. But it is true. He said, using the joke as a segue to a sermon, that we do tend to complicate things that are rather simple sometimes. And I thought it was timely that I read that joke online. And by the way, I think this other minister goes to fine jokes to tell at funerals and stuff. I, I don't, but I did stumble on this just last night, and I read it, and I went, that's very funny. But it's also really appropriate with a, um, a little sermon I had tucked away for moments like these. There are three instances in the Bible, three versions or three occasions of the same event in the Bible. <clears throat> and the reason for this is because there's four Gospels, and a lot of times in the accounts, some of the stories repeat themselves. So I'm going to read these three events, and we're going to decide together if they're all the exact same event, or if they all happen at different times, and they're similar events. But I think the point of what happens is the same. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, verse 13 says, Then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. In Mark chapter 10, it says, They brought little children to him that he might touch them. 
But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of heaven as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. It's pretty similar. But then Jesus throws in that extra point about, unless, you, unless everyone comes to God like a child, they're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So, well, in Luke, then they also brought infants to him that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Well, that sounds almost identical to the last one, except they're infants. This is sort of like one of those cool little puzzles where they have a bunch of pictures and you have to figure out which one's different than all the rest. I think these are three different events. And I have no reason not to think they're three different events when they're in my chronological Bible and they're not combined. Because they could have been, but they're not. But I think people's tendency to see them as one event told three ways has to do with a very secular outlook on life. One, we can't possibly believe that human nature is so predictable that this kept happening over and over again in Jesus' ministry. So reader beware, it happens three times in the Bible, but it really only happened once in real life because people aren't tedious and annoying in real life. We don't want to believe that, seriously. We don't want to have the Bible point out that again someone brought him kids and his disciples rebuked him, again he had to make that point. Now, it was the same event told three different ways. And then the other thing that's really secular about believing it's the same event told three different ways is, is the Rashomon theory. No, I'm not Greek or, or Hebrew on that. That's Japanese, Rashomon, R-A-S-H-O-M-O-N, Rashomon. Rashomon was a fam famous movie from long ago about a woman who has been raped and all the witnesses giving account of what happened. And each person tells a completely different story. And the movie is a series of people talking into the camera, telling their version of the same story. And of course, at the heart of that is a movie about perception, a movie about memory, a movie about bias. Again, a bunch of human elements placed on an event that only happened one way. You know, someone got raped, it's not open up to interpretation, but you have, you know, a dozen people telling a different story about how the events unfolded. And people think that about this passage of scripture, that it's, it's a Rashomon thing, that it's three different people telling the same story, that's why it varies. I would like to file it under who really cares, but the problem is, is it means something completely different if Jesus had to keep facing this problem in his ministry that children were an annoyance to the people around him and that he had the patience and wherewithal to stop what he was doing and minister to the kids. That's nice. The Bible's written about the same event, but we have three different versions that aren't exactly alike. That makes me nervous. That says, what other discrepancies are there in the Bible? One way says, this is just how it happened. It happened three different times. Three similar events happened three different times, and Jesus handled it similarly three different times. That's simple. Well, it was three different people's perspectives, so some of it changes here. You know, Matthew forgot to mention the, the exhortation about coming to God as children, and, 
And, well, there we go. All the way down to the words of Christ in red, it's subject to interpretation. Hey, you know, it's a different perspective. It's just what you make of it. Whatever you want to believe about the Bible, you know, it's what you can get out of it. It's what you can get out of it. My brilliant joke, and I call it a brilliant joke because I didn't make it up, but it is brilliant. I think any joke that could get grown-ups laughing without being dirty or racist, seriously, or, or, or blasphemous, which, by the way, I, I like dirty, racist, blasphemous jokes, especially if you can get them all together, but if you find a joke that can make a room full of grown-ups laugh without being dirty, racist, or blasphemous, it's really an accomplishment. It's sort of like making a G-rated movie that adults don't feel like they're seeing a kid's movie. And, <clears throat> but what was so brilliant about the joke is that it's actually very simple. The characters are brought in and then the punchline. It's just very simple. You know, there's not a whole lot to think about. You realize you're sitting there going, where's this going, where's this going? It's sitting there right in front of your face. A dog, you know, the lab comes in, the cat, you know, it's over. It's very funny stuff. And, but it also points out that sometimes it's just easier to be simple and it won't be so expensive. And I think that elaborating on the Bible, twisting its words, making it more than what it was, and my favorite, making it subject to interpretation, becomes costly in people's lives. And Jesus said, unless people come to me as a little child, they will never see the kingdom of God. And I think exactly what he said, and, and again, everyone's heard me say, it's bad to treat God like Santa Claus, meaning like you give him your, 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 your Christmas list. But, the Santa Claus example flipped around to a little kid is perfect. You can take a little kid to the mall and they'll really believe that's the real Santa Claus. There's no cynicism. There's no, there's no questioning. They, they just go, well, okay, that's Santa. Let's get to work. Let's, we got business. And they'll be happy to stand in line for that. Have you ever noticed that? Kids do just fine in the Santa line. Take them to see the new Disney movie and you stand in a long line, they go bonkers. Take them to Disneyland, keep them in line, they go bonkers. But put them in the center line, they're like, I want to see how this works. Okay. Every kid goes up. They get more than enough time. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they scope out the situation. They know exactly what they're getting. And it's in their language. All the times I took my kids to, to see Santa in the mall, um, I was invisible. This was, this was big. This was very big. This was very important. And I also noticed with my kids that they didn't really care about the presence. It wasn't about the presence. It was about that they were getting a, a, some time with Santa. You know, it's like, I, I've met a lot of celebrities. I don't ask for autographs. I have people, why don't you collect autographs? I like, I'm like, I'm collecting memories. Why do I need an autograph? Why do I need to stick something in their face and say, sign this for me when, you know, I just sat with them for a half hour, you know? I, I danced with Madonna and people ask me, did you get her autograph? I'm like, I danced with Madonna. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, hello. <laughs> And I guess people think, well, you're going to get old one day and you're going to start forgetting stuff. Well, if I forget dancing with her, I'm going to look at the picture. Who, who's that chick? <laughs> Is that one of my kids? Who <laughs> was that? Did I marry her once? You know? So Jesus says, unless we come to him with simplicity and without cynicism and without preconceived notions, and without screwy doctrine, and, and without subject to, to interpretation, unless we just come to him 
by way of point A to point B, we can't see what he's offering us. We simply can't see it. And, and I don't think he was saying, you know, you can't get saved if you don't humble yourself as a child. But I think he's saying you can't really experience heaven on earth to the degree you're called to and to, to the degree he died for without stripping yourself of your life experience, without stripping yourself of your education, without stripping yourself of your perspective of everything and take him at his word. That if you, can't, if you read the Bible and you have to challenge it, and you have to challenge it, you're missing the point of coming to the Lord as a child. Every single one of us has asked the questions about was the world really made in you know six days, and was it really a flood, and was it really just Adam and Eve, and was there was it really a snake, and was it this you know this you know all this stuff? We've all done that. We're, we're, that's normal. A little kid wouldn't do that. A little kid wouldn't do that. A little kid would be like, wow. Ah, it would take me longer than six days to clean my room, you know? But we, we're not kids. We're not kids. And, and, and we, are not, we are not exposed to simplicity. We are not encouraged in simplicity. We, and innocence is, innocence is non-existent. I saw someone I know uh, post one of those happy thoughts on Facebook, and it said, "You know, I was I I once looked at the world through the eyes of innocence, and then I realized that this was not an innocent world." And they talked about you know how they progress in life from innocence to awareness. And I sat there going, I've known you since you were a kid, honey, and you was never innocent. <laughs> never, never innocence. You never looked through the world through the eyes of innocence. Of course, I didn't write that. <laughs> I can't afford to lose any more friends on Facebook. But um, I, I was really, I thought that was really funny. I go, uh, I don't, our generation really didn't know much innocence. Really didn't know much innocence. Uh, you know, and maybe, you know, maybe when you were three, but I think you were shoplifting by the time you were three, but that was just me. But I, you know, this is, this is a foreign concept. Innocence and, and humility and <clears throat> at face value and at his word and without skepticism, without challenge, without needing proof. This, this is foreign to us. But there's an entire life beyond what we already know in Christ available to us if we take him at his word. And how do you how well, how do you how do you how do you impart that to someone? How do you how do you how, well, how do you sell that? How do you convince someone? It's almost impossible to get people to look at life differently than they already do. It's almost impossible. It's almost impossible to get people to, um, right here and now, say, I'm going to walk different, I'm going to live different, I'm going to think different. It's really hard to do that. And yet, we are called to a Holy Spirit renewal with each new day. Each new day we're supposed to get up and we're supposed to say, the slate's clean. I'm not obligating God to what he did yesterday and I'm not going to walk in the shortcomings of yesterday. I'm going to get before the Lord and I'm going to give him this day and let him make of this day what he wants to make of it. And that seems like a childlike choice. I think um, 
I think when kids get up every day, and I'm talking about young kids, not teenagers, but young kids, when they get up every day to go to school, they're pretty much, it's a, they're pretty much overwhelmed enough that whatever they're going to face that day is more than enough for them to think about. I don't think it's until we start getting older that we start going, well, I don't know, math is going to be really boring again, and, and uh, I, I'm not getting along with that kid, and this is happening, and that teacher, and you know, the, the problems, I, th I think that, not that, it, that young kids don't have problems, I don't think they stick the way they do when, as we get older. I think that the more something happens, the more pronounced it gets in our being. So that is a safe statement to say that we're more aware of the ick of our daily routine as adults than we are as, as toddlers. And I think that God, from the start, set up a system of holding on to that newness of life for our whole lives. I think, I think in the Garden of Eden, prior to the fall, we lived in a state of everything was always new. I don't think boredom, I don't think frustration, I don't think cynicism had been invented yet before the fall. And I think that God has always said, if you humble yourself before me, like a child, if you get before me, if you start each task and call on me, if you start each day and let me piece your day together, you will have a freshness and newness in your life that you can't manifest on your own, even if you're one of those happy, annoying, optimistic, energetic people that I don't get. Even if you're one of those people that there's something that only God by His Spirit can provide for us that, that is vitality, that is youth, that is being born again, again, and again, and again. And that is by saying, today I haven't had yet. So I am not entering into it with preconceived notions and unrealistic expectations except that if I call upon the Lord he will be present all day with me and I will feel his presence all day with me and there will be a freshness though there will be a we haven't done this yet -ness to this day I find as a minister um, that I'm very sensitive to beginnings, middles, and ends of seasons in the Lord. That um, it, that's exaggerated by the fact that, you know, I put out a new record every nine months and I change so much to go with it um, that I know what's coming. I know the change is coming. I know that means something's going to hit its peak and start to die off. And, and there's always a sadness at the end of something because, well, in my case, because I don't think it lasts long enough and I, I don't think I got as much out of it as I expected. And, you know, and, and I call it, I didn't get as much meat off the bones as I was hoping. And, and then God always shows me, he goes, well, it was just enough. It was just what it was supposed to be. It's just how it was. And you need to let go, get before me, and start fresh the next day like, like nothing ever happened. Like nothing ever happened. That tomorrow is the first day of your ministry and you don't come into your ministry with any success. And that means I don't have to come in with any failure either. And if this were the first day of my ministry ever, well, I didn't do too bad. So how you look at it, if you tack on the fact that it's 29 years, well, maybe I'm not doing so good. First day ever. But God literally calls us to look at life like today is the only day we have. And it's a new day and it's a fresh day and the remnants of yesterday aren't invited. No matter how good or how bad yesterday was, 
today is a new day in the Lord, and we have to be aware of that and open to that. And the only way we can be is to humble ourselves as children before him at his word, at his command, and purposely enter into this day with nothing except our total dependence on Jesus. Lately, I've felt a sense of uh, well, m melancholy about... I've seen so much change and I've seen so much start and finish on, in so many areas of my life and in so many areas in the lives around me that I can tell that in, in certain areas at least, but many certain areas, I'm at an end of the season. And I've seen a lot of endings to seasons. and. Even when it's bad ones, you still put in so much time and energy that when something bad ends, even though there's a certain degree of relief, you're like, yeah, but it took so much out of me. I wish I'd seen more come out of it. But I know this means that beginnings come next. <laughs> you know, that if endings are happening, the next one that comes is beginnings. Sort of like you know, our, our earthly seasons of winter, spring, summer, and fall. We know what's coming. It's been hot here in Phoenix. We've had a couple cooler days. There's hope that we may be out of the summer heat. But we know in a month from now, we're going to be out of the summer heat. It's, it's guaranteed. And I know if we are done with, if I'm done with, if I'm in endings right now, I'm on my way to beginnings. <laughs> and... I know that with beginnings, the only thing I can hope for is that I'm obedient to not drag all this baggage in with me. The bad and the good baggage. To say, this is all great, but the only thing I'm going to take on the next part of my walk with Christ is what he's grown in my character, what's inside me. I'm not bringing my expertise. I'm not bringing my, my, my stories. I'm not bringing, you know, my, my trophies. I'm bringing just me in obedience and hopefully some degree of humility before the Lord. And I think that's where spiritual purity lies, is accepting Jesus' admon Jesus admonishment for us to be like children humble before God means no preconceived notions that whatever whatever mojo we worked yesterday to get God to bless us yesterday is cursed today. If we say, well, this worked to get me what I wanted yesterday, I'm going to try it again today. It's cursed. There's instances in the Old Testament where... <clears throat> God says, I want you to go and do this. And then he blesses his people. And then the next day, they go and try to do it themselves the same way. And he says, I didn't tell you to do that. Moses hit the rock twice. Once was sufficient. And, and when God called the people to gather around Jericho, and the walls came down. What he wanted to see as a result of that were people that said, this is what God commanded us. We prayed. He talked to us. This is what he commanded us. We did what he said, and this was the result. So the next time they're in peril, he doesn't want to see people that gather around a city and shout. <laughs> he wants to see people that get on their knees and say, you were the God that brought down the walls of Jericho. What do you want us to do now? But the only way to do that is to take the memory of an event which you can't shake, but not hold God in prison in a 